Hello, Ashri here. So, ever since I made the last Marathi video, something in me has like changed. I don't know my guess explain karun, but it's like my inner khapthar pana has been unlocked and I'm pretty much offending people left and right. <laughs> Yeah, so in this sassy IIP zone, I thought of making a meme. What if Indian philosophies were like strategies in a game? It kind of blew up on the internet. A lot of you also asked me to make a detailed video about it. So this is that video. Acha, before we dive right into the heart of it all, let's take a step back and think about what is Indian philosophy in general. You must have heard that India is a, a land, land of, of seekers, seekers not, not a land of believers. Because in this country, we have always sought for something. Sought for what exactly? Well, you know the usual fun stuff: ways to reduce suffering, finding the meaning of life, attain enlightenment. Society, when affluent ho jati hai, then it climbs up the Maslow's pyramid. and we move to doing all this deep shit about life and uh, all that stuff and because like time pe indian civilization you know had 25% of the world's gdp it had enough time and energy to experiment with all the deeper questions of life and jitne log the utne approaches to life utne hi strategies to plan how life should be kafi kuch like playing a game of pubg uh bgm i sorry Different players have different strategies to win. Some prefer close range combat while others like sniping from a distance. Aap defensively bhi khel sakte ho ya you can drop into poaching ki and wage an all out war. The goal is the same to emerge victorious, but the paths to get there are multiple. So there is a natural analogy to how you play a game and how you live your life. Okay, another disclaimer, all of this is in good fun, so don't take it too seriously. If you're easily offended, maybe grab uh, like a chai or something and come back when you're feeling a little more chill. All right? Chalo, let's start with the first category, the easy mode. This is the easy mode where we are just playing the game casually. The strategies in this mode are beginner friendly. Matlab they are easy to understand and get started with, but that does not mean that they are necessarily easy to master. That is also why they are the most popular of all the strategies in this chart. Gaming terms mein bolu to it is tough to get a high score using these strategies, but game ke maze aap kafi le sakte ho. So, let's start with the first strategy, bhakti. Bhakti is the most democratic strategy out there. The Sanskrit word for devotion, bhakti is all about surrendering yourself to the game creator. In bhakti, you use your emotions to please the creator, worship the creator and basically dedicate yourself to him, hoping that along the path he will be impressed with your devotion and also maybe help you out. Bhakti strategy mein you don't imagine God as some mysterious abstract force in the sky. Instead, you give him a form, often an idol or a image. and not just that you see him like a person like a friend a child a master or a lover you basically humanize the creator now if you're not the emotional kind you might find all of this kind of sweet but also a little bit cringy i mean these guys are playing the game more from their hearts than their minds you could also say that since bhakti folks primarily operate through emotion no bhakti players can easily get corrupted They might end up following all sorts of cults, becoming excessively obsessed or even getting lost in the theatrics of it all and also get exploited in the process. But well, because of its raw appeal, bhakti is incredibly popular and not just in India but everywhere. You could also say that bhakti is like the gateway drug of religion. It's often the first step that people take towards exploring their spiritual side. Whether you're a casual player or a hardcore devotee, bhakti offers a way to connect with the divine on a very deeply personal level. Moving on, the Puran strategy. The Puran players are the second most popular players of the game. Puran or Purana, however you want to pronounce it, literally means old or ancient stories. If you are a Purana player, you are basically the ultimate lore nerd of the game. You know everything about the game's mythology, the stories of the top players, the many gods and demons, heroes, side heroes, all of that. Technically, the Purans are the collection of 18 major texts, each focusing on different aspects of the game lore. Some like the Bhagavad Puran are all about the avatars of Vishnu, which are also popular among the bhakti players. Bhagavata Puranam starts where Mahabharatam ends. It elaborates about the end of Mahabharatam and its aftermath. It talks about the history of Parikshit Maharaja, start of Kali Yuga and how it would unfold. Bhagavata Puranam also elaborates the account of the conversation between Uddhava and Vidura. Others like the Shiv Puran are a little more abstract and delve into the mysteries of the universe. Shiva Puranam illustrates the origins of Shiva in the form of Agni Stambham, the conflict between Sri Mahavishnu and Brahma. It talks about the sacred rituals of Shivalingam. It talks about the Shiva Tattvam, the philosophy of Shiva. 
Then there's the Skanda Puran, the longest Puran actually, which is about Kartikeya, the son of Shiva and Parvati. Skanda Puranam. It is the largest of all the 18 Puranas. Almost every sacred place in Bharat has a place in Skanda Puranam. But the Purans aren't a bunch of dusty old stories only. They are also packed with practical advice and spiritual wisdom. They teach players about enlightenment, the nature of karma, reincarnation, all of which help you level up in the game. Puran shouldn't be confused with Itihas, although they are often mentioned together side by side. And Purans and Itihas together are considered to be the fifth Veda or Ved. Fifth Ved. For players who love to LARP or live action roleplay or imagine themselves as the great heroes, the Purans and Itihas offer a wealth of inspiration. These epic tales provide a framework for understanding the world and your place in it and enact yourself as Maryada Purushottam Ram or Dharma Pitama Bhishma or the clever Shakuni or the strong Bhim. So, if you are ready to geek out on some ancient Indian lore, grab a copy of your favorite Puran and dive in. Just be warned, you might end up spending more time reading than actually playing the game. And if you don't understand the symbolism, you might take things literally and then be confused with all the conspiracy and… But hey, that's the life of a true Puran fan. Next, we move to the Smarta strategy or as an Australian would say, Smara, because it claims to be the smartest strategy. The smarter strategy is the jack of all trades strategy. It is all about bringing together the best bits of Hinduism into one package. The founder of smartaism was Adi Shankaracharyaji, who was kind of like the Steve Jobs of Hinduism. He looked at the different philosophies and practices spread all over India and he thought to himself, hey, we can simplify this for everyone. So he took the Vedanta philosophy mixed in a bit of yoga and then blended it all with a chutki of bhakti traditions and thus was born a streamlined user-friendly version of Hinduism that anyone could get into. The Smarthas are known for their Panchayatna Puja which is kind of like having an all-star team of deities. You have got Vishnu, Shiva, Shakti, Surya and Ganesha. In some Smartha tradition, there is even a sixth abstract and impersonal deity to represent the ultimate reality. And if you are in South India, you might see even Kartikeya join the party too. But here's the thing, Smarthas believe that all these deities are just different ways to connect with Paramatma. It's like having multiple paths leading to the same destination. You can choose one that resonates with you the most, but ultimately they all lead to the same place. Today, most Hindus, including you, have a bit of Smarthaism in you, even if you don't realize it. Aapke ghar mein jab puja hota hai, then you see multiple gods and goddesses ke murtis. They all come from the efforts of Adi Shankar Next on Karma Yoga. Karma yogis are the unsung heroes of the spiritual world. They are like the best supporting actors who sadly never get an award for it. Karma yoga is all about doing your duty without making a fuss about it or without expecting any kind of rewards. It's the ultimate just do it mentality. As we all know, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna famously tells Arjun, Yo Parth, you've got a job to do my man. Just do it bruh, just do it. Uh, alright, there's a slight chance that Krishna didn't say that, but well, you get the vibe, right? Karma Yoga is one of the four main paths to enlightenment in Hinduism. It's often seen as the easiest path because it does not require any special skills or knowledge. All you need is a willingness to work hard and have a sense of duty. Indians have long been Karma Yogis, I think. At a time when some countries would resort to violence and destroy their culture, our parents and grandparents were masters at showing up to work every single day and putting in the hours no matter how tedious the job was. Like seriously, can you imagine working a single job for 30 years? They had a knack for accepting whatever life threw at them with a smile, hoping to be good parents for us. In a way, this attitude has helped India weather many storms and emerge stronger today. However, it's also important to remember that being a karma yogi does not mean to be a pushover. Sometimes, all that selfless action can lead to people taking advantage of your good nature. And if you're not careful, you might find yourself stuck in a dead-end job or a stagnant situation. And because you're so detached from the end results, there is less incentive for you to innovate. I feel sometimes you do need obsession and attachment to give you a hundred percent. But well, those are just my thoughts. Who am I to argue with Krishna? So yeah guys, that concludes our easy tire. Before we move on to the next tire, guys, if you have been liking this video, 
Please do like and hit the subscribe button. It really means a lot. And yes, if you like this poster and would like to hang it on your wall to have a conversation starter with your friends, you can find a link in the description box below. Chali, let's now move on to the hard mode. These strategies are definitely not for the beginners. They require us to carefully understand a new framework to look at reality. And all these strategies involve breaking down reality into smaller fundamental components. This is kind of like looking under the game and tinkering directly with the code yourself. You won't find many casual gamers talking about these strategies at parties, but the true geeks, the ones who are hardcore nerds about the Vedas and the Upanishads will find a way to these strategies. All right, let's begin. Nyaya Nyaya is all about logic and epistemology, the study of truth. It's like Sherlock Holmes of Hindu philosophy, using deductive reasoning to solve the mysteries of the universe. Nyaya players have an algorithm developed to infer at universal truths, the nature of knowledge and even the existence of God. Nyaya players were the first to develop logical axioms like inference. For example, all humans are mortal, Shah Rukh Khan is a human and therefore Shah Rukh Khan is a mortal. This kind of way of thinking was the innovation of the Nyaya people. So you can imagine the Nyaya players as the detective debaters of the Hindu world. Next is Vaisheshika. Vaisheshika is the atomic theory of Hindu philosophy. If Nyaya deals with epistemology, Vaisheshika deals with ontology. Rather than an abstract truth, Vaisheshika looks at the physical existence of reality. It breaks down reality into its smallest components, which it calls Parmanu. And then Vaisheshika players try to understand how these Parmanus combine to create the world that we experience. It's kind of like playing a philosophical Minecraft, building up complex structures with simple building blocks. Vaisheshikas have also come up with the concept of new entities forming from the combination of basic entities, which they call Samyog. Kind of like how in Minecraft combining a stick and a coal gives us a torch. Vaisheshikas believe that everything in the world is built with such combination of building blocks. Blocks like Dravya, Gurn, Karm, Samanya, Vishesh, and somewhere. Next in line is Sankhya. Sankhya is the dualistic philosophy that sees the world as an interplay between Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is consciousness and Prakriti is matter. Sankhyas believe that Prakriti is made up of Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, which are the three abstract qualities out of which everything is made up of. Prakriti is drawn to Purusha like iron to magnet and from this interaction of Purusha and Prakriti, Buddhi or intelligence is created. From this intelligence, Ahankar or identity emerges and then from this Ahankar, 23 tattvas come into existence. Sankhyas believe that the world is real and cause and effect are tied together in one unit. Excellent description of the game mechanics, I must say. Finally comes Mimansa. Mimansa folks are the most conservative intellectuals of this tire. They focus a lot on Vedic interpretation. It's all about understanding the deeper meaning behind the rituals and the hymns of the Vedas. Mimansa philosophers have developed complex rules of interpretation, kind of like a secret code for unlocking the wisdom of the ancient rituals in the Vedas. So yeah, there you have it, the hardcore mode of Hindu philosophy. These strategies may not be for everyone, but for those who are willing to put in the work and the effort and the time, this tire offers a deep and rewarding path to understanding the nature of reality. Chali, let's now move on to... Welcome to the hacker mode. Look who decided to venture into the dark underbelly of Indian philosophy, the hacker mode. The place where the rules are bent, the boundaries are blurred and the mind is pushed to the end limits. If you thought the hard mode was intense, you haven't seen anything at all my dear friend. Let's start shall we? Buddhism Once upon a time in the game of life, there was a player named Siddhartha Gautam. He was born into a wealthy family and all his abilities were maxed out. But as he leveled up and explored the world more, Uzi realized that well, the whole game is rigged. No matter how many points he scored or how many enemies he defeated or how many treasures he acquired, the feeling of winning was always temporary. But the pain of losing again and again, that suffering Siddhartha realized was the only constant. Siddhartha, or as he would be later called the Buddha, had a revelation. The root of all suffering, he realized, was attachment. The desire to win, to conquer, to possess. These were the chains that bound players to the cycle of playing again and again and again, and thereby suffering again and again and again. 
The only way to break free from this was to let go of the game entirely. And so, the Buddha quit the main quest. He abandoned his clan, his wealth and his status and set out on a new path. Instead of competing for high scores and rare loot, he found happiness in the simple things of life. Chilling out in the scenery, driving a car around. All the peace stuff we know Buddhism for, right? <laughs> Here is where it gets trippy. According to Buddhism, there is no Blair. There is no true self. There is no Atma. There is no soul. Instead, the whole game is a set of predefined scenarios like nodes in a cosmic network. Our identities, our memories, our sense of being, all of these are illusions, projections of the mind that are already predefined. So you see, Buddhism isn't just about finding inner peace, it's about confronting the void. That void that exists in the heart of existence. That void that exists everywhere. Jainism Jainism takes a unique approach to the game of life. They believe that the simple act of existence causes violence. Every time we breathe, we walk, we talk, we eat, we kill millions of creatures. This violence is ingrained in the game. This is what causes suffering. Jains, however, don't just quit in the face of suffering. They've got a strategy to deal with it. Jains see suffering as a way to level up your character. They believe that by facing challenges head on, you can delete your negative karma points and ultimately conquer the game. It's like when you're playing a tough level and you keep dying and dying, you still know that you are getting better with each attempt. In the world full of suffering, reducing that suffering must be the only logical thing to do. Maybe this is the reason why Jain players do so well in the business world. They are not afraid from working hard and simultaneously they don't get attached so much to their wealth. No wonder we have folks like this Gujarati couple who gave away 200 crores of their life earnings. So in a game where suffering is built in, where being aggressive is not just accepted but also appreciated, the Jain strategy of embracing suffering is a hack of its own kind. Charvaks. Ah, the Charvaks, the ultimate rebels of ancient India. These guys made the Jains look like hardcore devotees in comparison. Charvaks are all about that seeing is believing life. If they can't see it, they ain't buying it. So much so that instead of the Panchabhut, fire, water, earth, wind and sky, they just believe in four. Cause they're like, what even is sky? Can you touch it? Can you feel it? What even is it? The Charvaks are also master hedonists. They don't believe that life is full of suffering. In fact, they think life is full of enjoyment. So much so that a famous Charva quote can actually be seen somewhere in a bar in Kanpur. Pitva pitva punha pitva yavat patati bhutale uthaya cha punha pitva punar janmana vidyate Drink, drink, again drink. Drink till you fall down. And after you get up, drink again. Cause there's no next life, my bro. There's another one. Yavat jivet sukham jivet ranam kritva ghritam pibet as long as you live, live happily. Drink ghee, even if you have to borrow money. That's a hardcore application of Zindagi Na Milegi Dobara. Charvaks, unsurprisingly, don't believe in karma, punarjan, or any kind of afterlife. They think that life is all we got, and we have to make the best of it. They're like the players who don't care about their score or leaderboard rankings. They just want to enjoy the game while it lasts. And that's a segue to the ultimate realists of the game, the Ajivikas. Imagine playing a fun video game. You have played it for days, applying your brain, your mind, your energy. You are about to be the best player in this game. You feel like you have achieved something. And then, your eyes move towards the joystick you are holding. You see that its wire is hanging, disconnected from the game console. It turns out that the game has been in the autoplay mode all along. All that feeling like you are a player who is winning at this game was all an illusion. Welcome to the Ajivika view of the world. In this strategy, your choices don't matter. Your stats, your skills, your moral decisions, they are all predetermined by the game developer. The very moment the Big Bang happened, everything you have done, everything you're doing and will do was all predetermined. Some modern day thinkers like Elon Musk have suggested that we might be it's living in a simulation. simulation. But hey, if everything is decided, maybe there's a weird sense of comfort in that, isn't it? If all your victories, achievements, success was not caused by you, that also means that all this suffering, pain and failure was also not because of you. There's no need to take blame on yourself. It's not like you have a choice, do you?
Dear Seeker, Congratulations! You have made it to the final part of our philosophical journey, the advanced mode. Here on we move into the domains that defy simple explanations, concepts that are so vast and profound that entire libraries could hardly do them justice, let alone this video. Brace yourselves, dear seekers, for the ideas we are about to explore now will challenge your perceptions of reality, consciousness and the very nature of existence itself. Let's start off with Advaita Vedanta. It won't be an overstatement to claim that Advaita Vedanta is probably the finest philosophy that has evolved from Hinduism. Everything converges here. Centuries and centuries of dhyan, research, logic, all merged into one fabric, Advaita Vedanta. Advaita is a realization that you, the player, are not separate from the game itself. You are the game. You are both the creator and the creation. You, my dear friend, are just the universe pretending to be whoever you are. Advaita Vedanta teaches us that the boundaries between the self and the non-self is just an illusion. In reality, there is only one player, one game, one consciousness, experiencing itself throughout infinite forms and scenarios. Birth and death, joy and sorrow, success and failure, all of these are just different levels in the great grand game. Advaita compels us to realize that the other players are not somehow our competitors who might be competing for limited resources. Advaita tells us that they are all extensions of the same infinite creativity. The vibration that vibrates in me is also the vibration that vibrates in you. And you is me and me is you. This is the ultimate message of Advaita Vedanta. You are not a disconnected fragment, a lost lonely soul. You are literally the universe. You are blessed to be the form that the universe takes to express itself, to discover itself. By embracing this truth, you tap into a source of power and creativity that is unbounded. This is similar to what Kashmir Shaivism has to say. In many ways, Kashmir Shaivism is the sibling of Advaita and also adds a new dimension to it. While both schools agree that the ultimate reality is one, Kashmir Shaivism emphasizes that the Brahman, which it calls the Paramshiva, is not an inert observer. It is a dynamic creative force that lives and breathes within you. In Kashmir Shaivism, the universe is not an illusion to be overcome. It is real. It is real unlike Maya. We are not expressions of one passive originator. We are literally the canvases, the playgrounds on which Shiva dances and manifests himself. According to Kashmir Shaivism, it is not about escaping the game, but realizing that we have the power to shape our experience within it. Kashmir Shaivism invites us to tap into this creative potential and not give in to nihilism. It challenges us to recognize the Paramshiva in us and break away all illusions and shape reality, not just be a slave to it. Tantra Tantra is an ancient philosophical tradition and believe it or not, it has been shaped by not just Hinduism but also Buddhism, Jainism and even Sikhism. At its core, Tantra emphasizes the divine feminine power or Shakti. Tantric practitioners have their own set of mantras and rituals that are quite unlike any other kind of worship. Some believe that these practices, including the use of yantras, meaning sacred diagrams, and mantras or sacred sounds, can be used to mold reality itself. The idea is that by tapping into the fundamental energies of the universe, you can alter the fabric of existence. Certain tantric rituals also use unconventional or taboo substances, such as alcohol or even blood. These shocking methods are intended to break down the space between the sacred and the unsacred, allowing the practitioner to truly bypass the material world. While some may dismiss these practices as superstitions, Tantra players believe that they have deep spiritual significance. There is something so primal and instinctive in Tantra that we find versions of it everywhere, from the Aghoris in Northern India to Vajrayana Buddhists in Tibet. Ultimately, Tantra is about embracing the full spectrum of human experience. Holy to unholy, light to dark, beautiful to grotesque. Tantra challenges individuals to confront their inner inhibitions and break through the mental and spiritual blockages. This path is not for the faint of heart. It requires a lot of courage and almost an ability to surgically operate on your psyche. However, for those who persist, Tantra is transformative and it can lead to a very deep understanding of the nature of reality. We now move on to the final strategy Yoga. People popularly believe yoga is all about physical exercises. Sure, it is a big part of it, but that's just a scratch in the surface. The yogic path is about constantly striving to become better and better version of yourself, seeking constant growth and expansion. The player begins by mastering the physical realm, practicing asanas to build strength, flexibility and balance. This prepares your body and mind for the deeper levels of practice. 
as you progress you learn to control your breath through pranayam harnessing the power of the prana or the life force energy this skill allows us to navigate the game's challenges with ease and grace as a yogi you then turn inwards using pratyahar to withdraw from all the distractions of the external world and focus solely on the inner landscape of your mind and then through dharana and dhyan you develop laser like concentration and the ability to meditate deeply along the way you also collect powerful tools and upgrades such as yam and niyam which serve as ethical guidelines and personal observances ultimately the goal of the yogic strategy is to achieve samadhi a state of pure consciousness the yogi then becomes the game master transcending the illusions of the material world In this sense the end game of yoga is not about accumulating points or achieving external victories rather it is about unlocking the infinite potential within oneself and realizing the true nature of reality All these 16 strategies are not exclusive you don't have to pick just one and to be honest there are a lot more than these 16 here i just pick 16 so that they fit in this grid The idea in Hinduism, the Indian way of life is to mix and experiment different styles. Create your own custom package for yourself. Create your own personalized strategy for yourself. This country has always been about celebrating multiple ways, multiple perspectives. There's always multiple different strategies. If you're emotional, you'll probably be into bhakti. If you're logical, nyaya would appeal to you. If you are having an algorithmic way of looking at the world, there is samkhya. If you don't like putting yourself in a box, you can be a charvak. If you like to read stories, there are the Puranas. If you want a more hands-on approach, there is yoga. Basically, there is something for everyone. And that is the true pluralistic inclusivity that I love about the Indian tradition. So guys, do comment in the comment section what did you feel like and what is your preferred path? And why do you prefer this preferred path? Do let me know in the comments. I'd like to thank PSI Boy, Gandev 68, Shomilina Taravdar, NFT Wala, Shantanu Banerji, Kunal Rathod, Narasimha Murthy, Joel John, Sanjio, Ashutosh Mukherjee, Dreadful Bodyguard, Pankaj Mandal, Debayan Mukherjee, Subhranshu Sanyal, Deepit Puriya Kastha, Shonali Datta, Hossein Ur Rahman, Atharva Bedarkar, Chinmay Gada, Subhashri Patnaik, Santosh Harish, सुहास नायर निखिल अंगद बख्शी पवन पमिदिमरी नैन काले अभिषेक पटनायक तृप्ति अग्रवाल अनिकेत जैन सुयश सिंह पीयूष कांति भौमिक मार्क वरुण कांबले आराध्य भारद्वाज अंजलि मौर्य संजूस डेविल्स प्रीतम दास गुप्ता रंजीत वाघ कृति तिवारी मृन्मय मेते अंकन समंता गौरव मिश्रा अर्षल पी रिचोर महेश्वर जानी अश्विनी पांडे एंड आशीष रय If you'd like to be a member and receive your shout out please consider joining as a YouTube supporter thank you everyone i'll see you in the next video bye bye